Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Sarah and the organizing committee for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share a bit of my story with you. As I was preparing for today's talk, a line from the classic Talking Heads song, Once in a Lifetime, got stuck in my head, although my earworm had a slight variation from the original. And you may find yourself speaking to a room full of gun lawyers, and you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? <laughs> I never saw, touched, or fired a gun until I was 42 years old. Eight years later, here I am speaking to the National Firearms Law Seminar. That amazes me. So without disrupting your hard-earned lunch too much, I want to share with you my story, the story of how a liberal professor became an armed American. I'll also share with you some of what I have learned as a sociologist over the past half dozen years. I have spent studying American gun culture. To begin, I don't want to assume you have any in-depth knowledge of what sociologists do, so let me highlight two common responses to the question of what is sociology. In the first place, the painful elaboration of the obvious. <laughs> and secondly, common sense made difficult. <laughs> so many people think that sociologists just tell us what we already know about the world in a much more tortured language. But as we know from efforts to promote common sense gun laws, one person's common sense is another person's nonsense. So there may be things about gun culture today that you, as people heavily involved in that culture, take for granted that are a revelation to people like me who come from outside that culture. This is why Peter Berger wrote decades ago that the first wisdom of sociology is this, things are not what they seem. As a liberal professor journeying into American gun culture, I've been continually surprised at what I have found how things are very much not what they seem from the outside. So despite the occasional bad press, I still believe in the promise of sociology to illuminate realities like guns and gun culture in our society. According to the great sociologist of the mid 20th century, C. Wright Mills, the sociological imagination allows us to grasp what is going on in the world and to understand what is going on in ourselves as minute points of the intersections of biography and history within society. And as I hope you'll see, a sociological imagination guides my approach to answering the question posed by the talking heads, how did I get here? Now knowing what I know now about the ubiquity of gun culture in America, I find it remarkable that I avoided guns for as long as I did in my life. But the orthodox liberalism of my social environment certainly helped. I grew up in a little town called Half Moon Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area. And in this land of unicorns and rainbows, I played sports. I revered Dr. Martin Luther King and I protested against apartheid in South Africa. I don't ever recall seriously talking about guns, either positively or negatively, growing up. But if someone had asked my opinion as an orthodox liberal, I would have said nothing much good comes from guns, so the fewer the better. After graduating from high school in 1986, I left California for Washington, D.C., where I enrolled in American University served as president of the College Democrats there and hosted a McLaughlin Group style political roundtable on the campus TV station. Our big concern at the time was global nuclear annihilation and so we didn't have much interest in the small arms of American gun culture. Disillusioned with politics after just two years, I left Washington and retreated into the ivory tower. I made my way back to California where I enrolled at UC Berkeley and got my undergraduate degree. And I entered the discipline of sociology where I've spent the past 30 years as a student and professor. But even when I left California for parts of the country that are more flush with guns and gun culture like Wisconsin and Indiana, I remained insulated from gun culture by my liberal academic bubble. 
in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin. I lived in Madison, which as you know, is known as the Berkeley of the Midwest. And in Indiana, for my first faculty job at the University of Notre Dame, I remained safely protected from thoughts of guns by my fellow card-carrying liberal academics. In 2005, I moved to Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and the liberal academic bubble insulating me from guns began to break down. I have to give a lot of credit for this to my wife, Sandy, who's a native North Carolinian. In fact, she grew up in the next town over, the next county over from Winston-Salem in a town called Moxville. Now, Moxville has the distinction of being named the number one most redneck city in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> and one of the key criteria for this distinction is the number of gun stores per capita. And Davy Outfitters, which is pictured here in the store, I've actually bought two or three guns from myself. So not only were guns a normal part of life for Sandy growing up in Moxville, she also served in the United States Coast Guard and qualified as an expert with the Beretta M9 that she carried when she was performing her law enforcement duties. One moment early in our relationship highlights how far apart we were in our experience of gun culture. We were driving down the highway between Winston-Salem and Moxville one afternoon and I looked out into a cornfield and I saw a wooden structure that seemed very out of place. I said, Sandy, isn't that a weird spot for some kids to build a fort? <laughs> she looked at me as if I was from another planet, which I actually sort of was, and said, well, that's a deer stand. And she further had to explain to me what a deer stand is used for. And for some reason, she married me anyway. Of course, North Carolina, in North Carolina, guns are not just limited to rednecks like Sandy. The whole state is lousy with gun culture. I actually met Sandy through tennis, and conversations with other white-collar professionals I played tennis with reinforced what I learned from Sandy. So my buddy who worked in healthcare marketing had several long guns that had been in his family for generations. My other buddy who worked in IT had two 40 caliber pistols a Glock and a Smith & Wesson. My mixed doubles teammate, a real estate agent, carried a gun when she showed houses. So talking to these friends, I began to feel like I was the only person in North Carolina who didn't have a gun. And this was an important first lesson I learned in my journey into gun culture. Guns are normal, and normal people use guns. This idea became the foundation for all of my scholarly work on American gun culture, as I made clear in a programmatic statement I published in 2017 called The Sociology of U.S. Gun Culture. I believe the organizers have provided you with a link to that article if you'd like to see it. Although I'm not the first scholar studying guns who has begun with this premise or come to this conclusion, the idea has yet to catch on in academia. A quarter century ago, in 1995, sociologist James Wright included among his 10 essential observations on guns in America that gun ownership is normative, not deviant behavior across vast swaths of the social landscape. The idea that guns are normal and normal people use guns may seem common sense to those of us gathered here, but it's actually a dramatic departure from the standard social scientific approaches that view guns and gun owners as deviant and research literatures that are dominated by criminological and epidemiological studies of gun violence. This theme is so constant that the New York Times ran a headline just last week declaring, gun research is suddenly hot. In fact, the story was about how research on gun violence is suddenly hot. Research on the lawful use of guns is as cold as ever. I'm in the academic equivalent of Siberia. And to quote the talking heads once again, same as it ever was, same as it ever was. Now when the media, especially the foreign media, call me for insight into American gun culture, 
I like to have a single simple statistic for them that highlights the normality of guns here. One I've been using recently comes from the 2017 survey of guns by the Pew Research Center. And I was fortunate to be able to consult on the design of that survey before they fielded it, and they asked many good questions, which of course I mean questions that I suggested they ask. Now one good question they asked that I didn't think to ask uh, was regardless of whether or not you own a gun, have you ever fired a gun? And Pew found that 72% of respondents said yes. That is nearly three quarters of all respondents. And extrapolated to the US adult population, that means that upwards of 180 million American adults have fired a gun before. If that's not a normal behavior in our society, I don't know what is. So for all the criticism we hear of the mainstream media, however, the media actually played an important role in my conversion to gun culture. Even before I started talking to Sandy about guns, I made an important discovery in a hotel room at the Country Inn & Suites in Columbus, Georgia. I was there for a tennis tournament with my son, and between his matches, I was flipping through channels on the TV. And by dumb luck, I landed on a History Channel marathon showing back to back to back to back to back to back episodes of the inaugural season of Top Shot. I didn't have cable TV at the time, so the idea that a mainstream channel would air a program that combined the basic premise of the reality TV show Survivor with a shooting gallery on steroids captured by high-speed videography was a revelation to me. And to this day, I remember the trick shot showdown in episode seven of that first season. Tara Paremba hit all of her targets shooting a Winchester Model 1873 rifle, Annie Oakley style, over her shoulder backwards using a mirror to aim. And Chris Serino drove two of three nails by hitting them on the head with bullets fired from a Smith & Wesson double action revolver. I didn't realize it at the time, but the excitement of watching the marksmanship skills of these top shot contestants planted in me a seed of interest in firearms. So getting interested in firearms because of top shot and sensitized to their normality by my developing relationship with Sandy inspired me to overcome my long-standing fear of guns by learning how they work. Sandy paved the way for this by calling her high school classmate from Moxville Jimmy Staley, who's a gun trainer for the North Carolina Highway Patrol, and Jimmy invited us to his farm for a shooting lesson. He loaded a magazine with 9mm cartridges, inserted the magazine into his 6 hour P226, and handed the gun to me. He showed me how to grip the pistol and said, go ahead. In January of 2011, as a 42 year old, I shot a real gun for the first time. It mattered, it definitely mattered. Unfortunately, we didn't take any photos that day. It was supposed to be a one-time experience to show me how guns work and so that I could say that I did it. And anxiety also wiped clean my memory of the precise moment when I pulled the trigger for the first time. But what I do remember is that I missed the target completely. <laughs> As I shot my way through the first magazine, Jimmy suggested adjustment, adjustments to my grip and stance and sight alignment and trigger press, and I walked each consecutive shot in closer to the bullseye. At the end of the session, Jimmy said, you did all right. Expecting to be frightened, instead I felt challenged. The experience was not unlike golfing. Golfers among us know that you can have fun golfing even if you are not a good golfer. And getting better at golf or even just making a couple of good shots in an entire round is enough to bring you back. Now, getting into guns was no, most assuredly not my intention that day, but after shooting fewer than 50 rounds, I was hooked. Which is the second lesson I learned in my journey into gun culture. Shooting is fun and challenging. It's fun in part because it is challenging. In these trying political times, 
this very attractive aspect of gun culture too often gets lost. So the first lesson I learned in my process conversion to guns is that guns are normal and normal people use guns. And the second lesson I learned is that shooting is fun and challenging. But at this point you may be asking yourself, what does gun culture 2.0 have to do with it? <laughs>